Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. I've mentioned on the show recently that I've been trying to improve my French on Duolingo. And for some languages, Duolingo has these stories where the characters have this conversation in an at least hypothetically real-world kind of scenario. And there's this one where two friends, Lily and Zari, are having uh, they're having a conversation in line to ride a roller coaster. And every time Duolingo has shown me this story, I have wound up mostly focused on the fact that the French word for roller coaster is montagne russe, or Russian mountains. Mm-hmm. And so every time I'm like, what is the story there? And that is how we got to this episode. So during this episode, we're going to be touching a little bit on amusement park history more generally, because there becomes a point where these two things are very tightly interconnected. But one thing we're not really going to talk about much is like roller coaster crashes and derailments and other similar incidents, because there have just been so many with so many different causes. It felt sort of like trying to mention all the car crashes in the building of the interstate highway system, right? It just felt like a list of carnage that wasn't adding up to some sort of greater understanding of anything. So that is not really going to be a focus of this. And also, I know there are a lot of roller coaster aficionados out there. And there are folks who have extremely strong opinions on specific roller coasters and types of roller coasters and roller coaster records and particular designers. So I just want to say up front that this is not in any way an exhaustive chronicle of every single thing about roller coasters. If we did not mention your favorite thing, this is more of like the trajectory of how these rides evolved uh, over the last centuries. That could be an entire podcast just called Coasting. <laughs> <laughs> and I would Maybe it. it is somewhere. Maybe. Uh, Montagne Russe got their start, as the name suggests, in Russia, specifically in Russia in the 17th century. As a winter pastime, people built wooden ramps and covered them with water, and that water then froze into a slick surface. And then riders would climb stairs or a ladder to the top of this frozen ramp, get into some kind of vehicle, like a sled or a hollowed-out log or even an ice block with a straw seat, and slide down. Often, at night, water would be applied to the ramp so that it could freeze back over into a new and totally smooth, fresh surface by morning. These frozen hills were nicknamed flying mountains. They could be up to 600 feet or 183 meters long, and riders reached speeds that were reportedly up to 50 miles an hour, which is about 80 kilometers an hour. Often at the end of the ride, you would come out at the base of a second tower, so you could climb up that and just do it all over again. The logs or the ice blocks were brought back up along a track to one side of the hill, or in some cases, when people were using more lightweight sleds, they would just be carried up the steps by the riders. These were really popular public attractions, especially around St. Petersburg, and wealthy people also built smaller versions of them on their estates for their own enjoyment. Two different empresses have been noted as having a particular love for the Flying Mountains. Elizabeth, who reigned from 1741 to 1762, and Catherine II, also known as Catherine the Great, who reigned from 1762 to 1796. So, super quick Russian history refresher. Catherine the Great did not directly follow Elizabeth. Elizabeth's successor was her nephew, Peter III, who ruled as emperor for about six months before being overthrown and assassinated. Catherine definitely played a part in his overthrow. There is still some debate over her role in his death. If you watch the show The Great, that is a version not entirely (laughs) historically accurate. But I love it. Yeah. So some sources say that Catherine the Great was the first person to have one of these mountains fitted with grooves that could accommodate carriage wheels so that they could be used in the summer. 
But English clergyman John Glenn King, who was chaplain to St. Petersburg, wrote a letter in 1778 in which he credited Elizabeth, saying that Elizabeth had a flying mountain built at the Imperial Palace at Tsarsky Selo that was usable during the summer and the winter. Catherine does seem to have built more than one of them as well, including one at Orninebaum Park in St. Petersburg. King described the flying mountain this way. Quote, you will observe that there are five mounts of unequal heights. The first and highest is full 30 feet perpendicular altitude. The momentum with which they descend this carries them over the second, which is about five or six feet lower, just sufficient to allow for the friction and resistance and so on to the last, from which they are conveyed by a gentle descent with nearly the same velocity over a piece of water into a little island. He went on to say, quote, These slides, which are about a furlong and a half in length, are made of wood that they may be used in summer as well as in winter. The process is two or four persons fit in a little carriage and one stands behind. For the more there are in it, the greater the swiftness with which it goes. It runs on casters and in grooves to keep it in its right direction, and it descends with a wonderful rapidity. Under the hills is a machine worked by horses for drawing the carriages back again with the company in them. Such a work as this would have been enormous in most countries for the labor and expense it cost, as well as the vast quantity of wood used in it. There's a little bit of conjecture around how the Russian flying mountains made their way to France and evolved into Montagne Russe. One likely scenario is that French soldiers saw them in 1812 when Napoleon invaded the Russian Empire, although some of the sources used in this episode say the first one in France was actually built before that. Most of France really did not get cold enough in the winter to maintain a frozen sliding surface. So, like the Russian empresses did during the summer, builders in France turned to vehicles that could roll down the hills on wheels. They had no safety equipment, People just had to hang on. Yeah. Uh, This episode just had a particularly large amount of sources saying totally contradictory things with absolute authority. (laughs) So uh, I found some sources that said the very first of these were built in, in 1812, and then others that very confidently said that the first one was in like 1804. And which is right, I don't know. In an 1816 journal entry, though, Armand Marie Antoinette de Plessis, Marquise de Montcalm Gozon, describes a French montagne russe this way quote, It is an inclined plane made of planks of 60 feet more or less, at the top of which is placed a sled on which one sits, and which brings you to the bottom with an extreme rapidity. This pleasure, which is not without danger, may be compared, according to the opinion of several people, to the impression that one would feel if one fell from a fourth-floor window, which does not seem very seductive. These mountains are made of ice in Russia, and one hopes, in spite of the difference in climate, to imitate them in winter. A man said, in speaking of them, that he was surprised that this fashion does not elicit complaint against the influence of Russia, which is very common today to render responsible for everything. These amusements were extremely popular in France, and they were also known as promenades aériennes, or aerial walks. There were songs and plays about them, and people could buy all kinds of mountain souvenirs. Intense rivalries also developed between competing mountains, and in 1817, these rivalries even inspired a satirical play called The Battle of the Mountains, or Beaujou Folie. This popularity was somewhat ironic. Number one, these attractions seem to have been most popular and most widespread in France in 1816 and 1817. In other words, during the year without a summer, which was much chillier and much rainier than normal. You can look out for an upcoming Saturday classic on the year without a summer. Number two, this was just after the end of the Napoleonic Wars. France had been defeated in 1815, and Napoleon had abdicated for the second time. Under the Treaty of Paris of 1815, which officially ended the war, France was occupied by the nations it had fought against, and those occupiers included Russia. 
It's possible that the number of Montagne Russe built in France during the 18-teens was made possible by Russian occupiers, who already knew how to do it. But it's also a little odd that French citizens seem to have really flocked to and celebrated something that was so closely associated with Russia, something that the Marquise alluded to in her journal entry. Montagne Russe also became a metaphor in France during this period, both in literature and in casual conversation, a lot like roller coaster can be used today to describe the various up and downs of life, among other things. Most of these attractions closed by the end of 1818. Sending a wheeled vehicle down a wooden track at high speeds naturally caused a lot of wear, and these tracks weren't maintained very well, so they eventually broke down. The popularity of the Montagne Russe also plummeted that year after two riders were killed when the car that they were in stopped suddenly. The post-war occupation of France also ended in 1818, and it's possible that after that point, people did kind of want to get away from all the foreign influences. We should also take a moment here to note that French is not the only language to call roller coasters some variation on Russian or Russian mountains. A lot of other languages in Western Europe do, including Spanish, Portuguese, Basque, Catalan, and Italian, among others. The next stretch of roller coaster history, kind of like this one was, uh, is a little contradictory and sometimes vague, and we will get to it after a sponsor break. If you pull up five different articles about roller coasters, you may find at least that many completely different and yet totally authoritative declarations of which thing was the first roller coaster. Some of them also either name the Russian Flying Mountains or the French Montagne Russe that we already talked about. And to be fair, these do seem pretty similar to roller coasters, especially the ones that, like, specifically describe going down this, like, progressively uh, smaller series of hills. We are going to talk about some of the other various contenders. In the 1830s and 40s, a number of centrifugal railways were built in various cities in Europe. There's some speculation that these were inspired by children's toys in which you would keep a marble or a ball rolling around on the inside of a wire track. A centrifugal railway was basically a downward slope leading into a circular vertical loop with an upward slope on the other side. Riders would get in the car on one end of the slope and ride through the vertical loop to the other side. Accounts of these centrifugal railways suggest that it was as much about the terrifying thrill of the experience as it was about watching other people do it and maybe not coming out unscathed. This was just not a smooth ride. It was full of jolts and bumps, and because the loop was shaped like a circle, the gravitational forces involved could be really intense. Uh, There also wasn't really any safety equipment, reportedly not even, like, seatbelts. Centrifugal force was what was supposed to keep people in their seats, and that worked as long as nothing happened to cause the car to either slow down or stop suddenly. Builders tested these railways by sending a variety of inanimate objects through the loop, like eggs or sandbags, as well as animals, including monkeys. In the 1860s, a coal transport near what's now Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, became an amusement ride. Starting in 1828, the Mock Chunk Switchback Railway had carried coal about nine miles, mostly downhill, from the mines to the Lehigh Canal. A brakeman controlled the speed of the descent, and once enough cars had reached the bottom, a mule team would haul them back to the top. A return track with a steam-powered hauler was added in 1844. This return track was ratcheted to keep the cars from sliding back down if the hauler stopped for some reason. Ratchet systems are still used on anti-rollback devices on roller coasters today. That's what makes that repetitive clacking noise that you hear when a roller coaster is being pulled up a hill. In about 1865, the Mock Chunk Switchback Railway started carrying human tourists as passengers in the evenings when the mines weren't running. Then in the 1870s, construction of a tunnel made the railway unnecessary for coal transport, and this railway became a tourist attraction full-time. It ran as a tourist attraction until closing in 1933. 
At around the same time that the Mock Chunk Switchback Railway became a dedicated tourist attraction, other inventors in the United States were working on inclined railways. This term could have a few different meanings. Railways meant to pull loads up a hill, funicular railways with two counterbalanced carriages connected by a cable, and roller coaster like amusement rides were all called inclined railways. John G. Taylor was granted a patent called Improvement of Inclined Railways in 1872. His patent shows two parallel tracks, each of them with hills of various sizes, and the car would roll from the highest point down to the other end. His description makes it clear that there were already inclined railways being built, but that his was better because it had a switch that would move the car from one track to the other so that people could continue the journey in the other direction. Once passengers had disembarked, the car would be manually moved up a short hill before being switched back to the other track at the starting point. While Taylor's patent describes what he calls an improvement, it doesn't have all the details of a working device. Like, it doesn't say how the car would be stopped at the end of the line. While the illustration has a little set of steps suggesting where a passenger would disembark, the steps connect directly to one of the rails, and there's no corresponding platform for people to get on the railway. So older sources often describe this as a patent that was issued for an idea, not an invention that Taylor ever actually made. However, there are multiple newspaper articles mentioning Taylor's patented inclined railway carrying actual passengers, and there is even at least one photo. As one example, the August 15, 1874 edition of the Middletown, Connecticut Daily Constitution claims that Taylor's Railway carried 250,000 passengers the year before with no injuries. Richard Knudsen was also issued a different patent for improvement in inclined plane railways in 1878. This one featured a lift at each end of the track for raising the car back up to the top. It's possible that Knudsen built one of these, maybe even at Coney Island, which wasn't far away from where he lived. But if he did, no documentation has been found of that yet. We don't really know who coined the term roller coaster, but according to the Oxford English Dictionary, its first written usage in English was in the Chicago Tribune in 1883. There were some earlier uses than that, though, including in the Steuben Republican of Angola, Indiana, and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. The Steuben Republican describes a roller coaster as the chief attraction at the Tri-State Fair, calling it, quote, a small improvement on the old-time sport of riding downhill and trudging up the best way you can. The roller coaster described in this article is on an inclined circular track about 600 feet long with 15 or 20 people riding on a long bench-like car for a ride that lasted about 12 seconds. The ride described in the Chicago Tribune a few days later was also circular with a circumference of about 430 feet and a drop of about 22 feet. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch mention of roller coasters that came out around this time is in a pair of ads. One of them is, quote, roller coaster sliding downhill on wheels, Lucas Place and 20th Street. And the other is, quote, roller coaster, the old-fashioned sleigh ride. Don't fail to take a ride, Lucas Place and 20th. Uh, And also to further complicate this whole Oxford English Dictionary citation of the Chicago Tribune is the first mention, A few days before the Tribune published an article about a roller coaster being built, which is what the OED cites as the word's first use. It also published an ad. Uh, This ad specified that E.C. Hudson wanted to hire a man to act as the roller coaster's manager at a salary of $20 a week. So before the building of the roller coaster was reported on, he was trying to hire somebody to run it. And now, nearly two-thirds of the way through this episode, we are finally getting to someone who is very frequently described as the inventor of the roller coaster, or the inventor of the first modern roller coaster, or the inventor of the first commercially successful roller coaster, LaMarcus A. Thompson, who built the Switchback Gravity Pleasure Railway at Coney Island, New York in 1884. Some accounts say he modeled it after Richard Knudsen's patent and others after the Mock Chunk Switchback Railway. Thompson had invented other things, including a car coupler and a knitting machine. 
In some accounts, he had worked himself to exhaustion on the knitting machine business, and that had led his doctor to advise him to spend more time outside, and that's what led him to build a roller coaster. In other accounts, he was a devout Christian and was concerned about the temptations of beer gardens and other vice-ridden pastimes on young people, and he wanted to offer an alternative. It may have been both. I found zero primary sources confirming any of that, and every time I read some detail, I was like, where are you getting this? (laughs) In addition to the fact that we've already talked about a whole lot of things that could be called the first roller coaster, Thompson's roller coasting structure, patented in 1885, doesn't seem all that roller coastery in a lot of ways. There were two parallel tracks with the ends of the tracks at the same height, and riders would go out on one track and back on the other through a series of slopes that look pretty gentle in the patent illustration. Since friction and air resistance and other factors meant that the car wouldn't be able to get to the top at the far end of the track by itself, it did so by, quote, means being provided to continue the car to the top. That meant that somebody pushed it the rest of the way. Passengers rode sideways on what was basically a bench, and they traveled at about six miles an hour. So this was more about getting a view of Coney Island than about any kind of extreme thrill-seeking. Maybe riding a bench at six miles an hour would have felt really thrilling at the time. Uh, A lot of people run that fast. (laughs) Found that a little amusing. Um, For that reason, sometimes Thompson's rides are called scenic railways rather than roller coasters. But slow or not, Thompson's first ride at Coney Island was extremely popular. People paid five cents to ride it, and he recouped all the money he'd spent to build it in about three weeks. He also kept working on developments for his invention, and by 1887, he held about 30 patents related to roller coasters. He also founded a company to build scenic railways, which often took riders past dioramas, scenery, and other theatrical and visual elements. Um, There are a lot of comparisons to the It's a Small World ride. (laughs) At Disney, but on a railroad instead of... uh... Well, it makes me think of the Disneyland Railway, which is like you know the train ride that goes past dioramas, and you're like, oh, dinosaurs. Um, (laughs) I've never been to Disneyland, so I don't know that one. I it got reworked and I don't I don't want to make any promises. I don't remember what all if anything got added or subtracted there, but um that's how it's worked for a long time. We call it rolling bench. It makes us so happy to just sit there and watch beautiful things. I'm going to say on the couple of times that I have been to Disney in Florida, not in California as an adult, I have delighted in the rides where you just sit down in a cool space and ride and look at things. Oh, give me the people mover all day long. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to move on to the spread of rides like these or faster versions of rides like these after a quick sponsor break. Before we talk about how roller coasters proliferated, especially in the United States, we should talk a little bit about the development of amusement parks because especially from this point on, Roller coasters and amusement parks are very tightly linked. So there's not really one linear family tree of amusement parks. It's more like multiple possible influences going all the way back to the medieval period. Some of their earliest precursors were probably European trade fairs, such as St. Bartholomew's Fair, which started in England in 1133. This was an annual event that incorporated both trade and entertainment, and through the centuries, St. Bartholomew's and other fairs gradually became more and more focused on food, drink, and amusements, including rides. For example, there were early versions of Ferris wheels at St. Bartholomew's Fair in the 17th and 18th centuries. Overlapping with trade fairs were pleasure gardens, which operated during most or all of the year rather than just for a few days or weeks at a time. This also had a lot of food and entertainments and rides. Sometimes these were built by the owners of inns or taverns who were looking for ways to bring in more clientele during their slower periods. Then the 19th and early 20th centuries saw the rise of large, international exhibitions or world's fairs where the nations exhibiting at the fair showed off their new developments and accomplishments. 
Many of these fairs featured ethnological expositions that were essentially human zoos. The World's Columbian Exposition of 1893 also had an entertainment area that was separate from all the exhibitions, which it called the Midway. And it was like a carnival with sideshows, food, and rides. This intersects with the rise of trolley parks toward the end of the 19th century. In many areas, trolley lines were charged a flat fee for electricity, regardless of how many trolleys were running or how many passengers those trolleys were carrying. So this was something that was mostly happening in the United States, and a lot of trolley companies started investing in attractions at the end of the line to try to bring passengers onto the trolley on their day off of work. Often the entry to the park itself was free, and then people would pay for rides and food and drink. In 1902, Day Allen Willie wrote of this, quote, The expression trolley park may not as yet have come into common use, but no explanation of its meaning is necessary. The oldest of the trolley parks has been in existence but a few years, yet today these resorts are to be found on the outskirts of nearly every city in the land. The fact is that the street and suburban railway companies realizing the profit arising by catering to the pleasure of the masses have entered into the amusement field on an extensive scale. There were other factors involved besides just the trolley lines wanting to make money. Among other things, increased urbanization meant that there were more city dwellers looking for some kind of outdoor recreation. By 1919, almost every major city in the U.S. had at least one trolley park. Coney Island in New York was one such destination. By the middle of the 19th century, it had already become a seaside resort area thanks to its location at the southern tip of Brooklyn, New York. Its shift into being associated with amusement parks started with the construction of individual rides, including the Switchback Gravity Pleasure Railway. The first enclosed amusement park built at Coney Island was Sea Lion Park, which opened in 1885. The most famous of these parks was probably Luna Park, which opened in 1903 and then became the namesake for a lot of other amusement parks all over the world. More trolley parks and more amusement parks meant more rides, including more roller coasters, and that led to a lot of developments being made really, really quickly. In 1885, Philip Hinkle developed a hoist that pulled cars up to the top of the first hill, which let the cars start out higher and ultimately reach a faster speed. In 1894, E. Joy Morris produced the figure-eight side friction coaster, which had wheels rolling along the track's inner edge and allowed for faster speeds and tighter turns. This was also the first widely mass-produced roller coaster, making it possible for parks all over North America to buy and build one of their own. Over the next decades, a rise in mechanization and mass production techniques made it possible for more designers to create roller coasters that would give the same consistent ride every time, no matter where the coaster was built. At least hopefully. (laughs) In theory. (laughs) In theory. Uh, Two people who were working on vertical loop roller coasters near the turn of the 20th century were Lena Beecher and Edwin Prescott. Prescott was awarded a patent for the -the loop-the-loop, which was installed at Coney Island. Like the centrifugal railways that had been built in Europe more than 50 years before, this featured a circular vertical loop. In 1899, Lena Beecher developed another circular vertical loop roller coaster called the Flip Flap, which was also built at Coney Island. Then in 1901, Edwin Prescott developed a looping roller coaster with a teardrop-shaped loop, which reduced some of the excessive G-forces that riders were subjected to in a circular loop. Uh, A lot of roller coaster loops still have that kind of teardrop-shaped design today, And then Beecher soon adopted a teardrop-shaped design for his own vertical roller coaster as well. John Miller worked with a number of different roller coaster designers, including LaMarcus Thompson, and he was issued his first patent in 1910 for a safety device called the chain lift, which kept roller coaster cars from rolling backwards. This was the first of many patents Miller was awarded, a lot of them for safety features, or for features that made it possible for roller coasters to go faster, higher, or through sharper turns than they did before without crashing or derailing. 
Another of his major innovations was under-friction wheels, which helped prevent derailments, and he patented those in 1919. By this point, amusement parks were being built in other parts of the world as well, often with American engineers or designers working as consultants or with American companies providing blueprints or even entire disassembled rides to be put together on site. In 1910, this had reached the point that the U.S. Department of State recognized amusement parks as a trade opportunity and asked trade consuls to gather information about existing parks and opportunities to build new ones all over the world. By the 1920s, there were amusement parks on every continent except Antarctica, many of them patterned after the parks on Coney Island. And this was a really, like, a heyday for roller coasters. The Coney Island Cyclone, built in 1927, reached speeds of 55 miles, or 89 kilometers per hour, and it had an 85-foot drop, something that's not nearly as fast or tall as most newly built roller coasters today, but it was, at the time, groundbreaking. The Coney Island Cyclone still stands today and is billed as the second steepest wooden roller coaster in the world. The boom in trolley parks, amusement parks, and roller coasters in the United States was also happening alongside increasingly legislated racial segregation in many parts of the country. Many parks either allowed only white patrons or allowed patrons regardless of race but also had segregated facilities like restrooms and only allowed white patrons in some areas like restaurants. But there were also Black entrepreneurs who opened their own parks, such as Joyland in Chicago, which was the first Black-owned and operated amusement park in the United States. In the United States, amusement parks and their roller coasters started to go into a decline during the Depression and World War II. During the Depression, people often just didn't have the money to visit an amusement park or to invest in building a new one. During and after World War II, people became more focused on exercise-based recreation, such as organized athletic teams. The post-war baby boom also led to more parks that were focused specifically on recreation for children. As more people started driving cars and the U.S. started building more roads and highways to accommodate them, the idea of taking a train or trolley to the park at the end of the line started to fall out of fashion. This was not as true in other parts of the world, though. As the amusement park economy cooled in the United States, American developers started intentionally focusing on other countries, some of which continued to build new parks all the way through the 1930s and 40s. These ongoing international efforts by American companies to build amusement parks and roller coasters in other countries may be why in Russia, for example, roller coasters are not Russian mountains. They are American Gorky, uh, or American slides, basically. And there are a lot of other languages whose words for roller coaster include some version of American. These include Ukrainian, Estonian, Latvian, and Lithuanian. In the 1920s, there had been thousands of roller coasters in the United States. But as the 1960s approached, there were fewer than 200 still in operation. But then there was another big shift with the opening of Disneyland in Anaheim, California on July 17, 1955, followed by the opening of the Matterhorn roller coaster there on June 14, 1959. Sometimes the Matterhorn is described as the first steel track roller coaster, but there were earlier steel coasters. What set the Matterhorn apart was that the tracks were tubular, meaning that the ride was a lot smoother than on earlier coasters. Disneyland is often credited with sparking a resurgence in the building of theme parks in the United States. Sometimes people use theme park and amusement park interchangeably, but there's a little nuance there. Basically, theme parks are amusement parks designed around a theme. It's pretty self-explanatory. The development of tubular steel roller coaster tracks paved the way for so many other roller coaster innovations. Just as some examples, the first corkscrew roller coaster was the Roaring Twenties Corkscrew at Knott's Berry Farm in California, which was later moved to Silverwood Theme Park in Idaho. The first shuttle-launched coasters were developed in 1977, and the first roller coasters with interlocking vertical loops debuted in 1978, one of those being the Loch Ness Monster at Busch Gardens in Virginia. 
The first suspended roller coasters opened in the 1980s, with riders hanging below the rail rather than sitting above it, in a car that could swing as it went around turns. The first inverted coasters, which have riders similarly below the track but don't swing out in that way, came out in the early 1990s. Electromagnetic propulsion systems were introduced for roller coasters in the 1990s, making it possible for coasters to be launched very quickly rather than pulled up hills to coast most or all of the rest of the way. Today's biggest, fastest roller coasters are so different from the ones that we talked about earlier in the show. Currently, the tallest roller coaster in the world is listed as the King to Kai at Six Flags Great Adventure in New Jersey. That is 456 feet or 139 meters tall. And the fastest at this moment that we're reading is uh, Formula Rasa at Ferrari World Abu Dhabi, which reaches speeds of 149.1 miles an hour, which is 240 kilometers per hour. So, of course, there have also been a lot of safety innovations throughout these same years to try to make it possible for coasters to go that high and that fast without being just extraordinarily deadly. While fatal roller coaster disasters are rare at this point, less severe injuries are a lot more common. It's kind of tricky to give exact numbers because a lot of statistics group amusement park rides together rather than isolating roller coaster injuries specifically. Yeah, even with all the various, like, shoulder harnesses and, uh, you know, other ways to try to keep the passengers in these safe, like, it's still a lot of, a lot of drops and a whipping around and, like, there are opportunities for uh, various physio- physiological consequences right. of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we will talk some more about roller coasters on Friday. And in the meanwhile, I have listener mail from Jeff. Uh, Jeff wrote and said, Love the show. I've been listening for years. Just an added note on modern day use of military balloons. I was a paratrooper in Canada in the 90s. When paratroopers train with other allied countries or airborne forces, they are often awarded that country's jump wings as an honorary sort of thing. My regiment sent soldiers to the UK to work with the parachute regiment. While there, they did basic UK parachute training and they were awarded their British jump wings. The training jumps they did were from balloons. I don't know if they still train this way or not, but they did in the 90s. The balloon was on a winch that could be raised and lowered. The candidate got in the basket and the winch was spooled out to about 1,000 feet. They opened the door on the side of the basket and performed their drills with the instructor and then jumped out of the basket and parachuted to the ground. The basket was then winched back down to pick up the next candidate. Here's a link. Jeff. I did not know that, Jeff. Uh, But that makes total sense that that could be uh, a good way to get people trained on doing parachute jumps. Uh, If you would like to send us a note about this or any other podcast, we're at HistoryPodcast at iHeartRadio.com and we're all over social media at Missed in History. So you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you like to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.